Hi, it's Dwyer, richarddwyer.co, always 1776.com. Let's talk about the Kennedy assassination. Let's ask some questions that need to be asked. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, it is November 22nd. 1963. Around 12.30 p.m. The presidential motorcade is on Houston Street. It makes a left turn onto Elm Street. To the right of the car is the Texas School Book Depository. On the fifth floor, at that moment, are Bonnie Ray Williams, Harold Norman, and James Jarman Jr. Now understand, those men on the fifth floor then hear shots from the floor right above them. The sound is so clear that they could even hear the shells hit the floor. They see no one come down from the sixth floor. Several Texas School Book Depository employees are by the stairs. They see no one come down the stairs. Now here's what we know. Three shots are fired from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. The second shot is the so-called magic bullet, right? That's the shot that hits Kennedy in the back, according to the Warren Commission, then travels forward, hits Texas Governor John Connolly. Then, of course, the third shot is the head shot that ends President Kennedy's life. Now, what I want people to do is to focus on the first shot. Right, the first shot. When the gunman sticks the gun out the window and he waits until the last moment, because there is videotape of the window shot from Houston Street that does not show a gunman in the window. Well, we know that at least six people, six, looking up at that sixth floor window, right above the fifth floor where three employees are, right again, Bonnie Ray Williams, Harold Norman, and James Jarman Jr. We know that there are at least six people looking up at the window. And of course, they see a gunman appear in that window. Understand, the way the window is, is it's low. You have to crouch down to shoot out the window. Well, understand, they spot the person who then sticks the rifle out and starts firing. Amos Unins, a teenager, sees the rifle fire at least two shots. He's so thrown by it that he goes behind a concrete barrier. He sees it happen. He sees that the gunman has a bald spot. Others notice the gunman's clothing. Now this is very important because we know that a member of law enforcement, Marion Baker, runs into Oswald with Oswald's boss, Roy Truly. The two men enter the building right after the assassination and they can see what Oswald is wearing. 
right? Oswald clearly doesn't have time to change. In the 90 seconds or so between the shooting from the sixth floor and when he's spotted by law enforcement on the second floor, we know what he's wearing. Keep in mind, too, it's deeper than that. Oswald works in a building with dozens of people. His co-workers saw what he was wearing. Well, understand, five of the six people, five of the six, who saw the gunman in the window, described the gunman as wearing lighter colored clothes. One person refers to khakis. Another person refers to a white shirt. We know Oswald was wearing none of that. He's wearing a dark colored shirt and dark colored pants. Now, it's not 1963. As I make this video, it's 2021. I believe most of us interested in crime here on YouTube have seen enough shows on Oxygen and ID to understand that if Oswald had gone to trial, his lawyer had a lot to work with. Right, folks, it's so bad that one of the witnesses, and this witness has problems, he claims the gunman was standing up, which is not possible. Right, it's not possible given the low location of the window. But Howard Brennan sees Oswald in a lineup that day. And he says, you know what? This guy's clothes are different than the clothes I remember. In fact, what I'm going to do here, because I understand that this case has a lot of interest, is we'll actually go through the actual statements Howard Brennan made, right? Howard Brennan pointed out that Oswald at the police station, according to the book, 22 November, 1963, right? Howard Brennan made the quote that Oswald, here's the quote, was not dressed in the same clothes that I saw the man in the window. He just didn't have the same clothes on. Right? The commission reacted to Brennan's unexpected information by abruptly dismissing him. Mr. Brennan, he didn't have the same clothes on. Mr. Bellin, the questioner, all right. Mr. Brennan, I don't know whether you have that in the record or not. I am sure you do. Mr. Dulles, Alan Dulles, any further questions? I guess there are no more questions, Mr. Bellin. Mr. Bellin, well, sir, we want to thank you for your cooperation with the commission. That's the exchange with Howard Brennan. So, let's just say a gunman is spotted in the window of the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. And he's wearing different clothes than Lee Harvey Oswald. Not only that. Some of the six people who claim to have seen the gunman claim that his hair was lighter than Lee Harvey Oswald's hair. I would argue that the actual eyewitness evidence is the best evidence on who shot President Kennedy, right? Well. Let's just go over some facts and then let's dive a little bit deeper into this case. Understand that Lee Oswald, as he called himself, he only uses Harvey, Lee Harvey Oswald, in official documents with the government. Right? We remember him as Lee Harvey Oswald. The people around him remember him as Lee. Well, Lee Oswald was not licensed to drive in the state of Texas. He didn't have a car. He did not own a home. He was a renter. He was married. 
So he's married, he's living with his wife, at other times he's in a boarding room, he always has a landlord. The Manlicher Carcano rifle that he bought, this is after his return from Russia, was misaligned. The scope was off. Right? Understand, law enforcement in looking at the gun felt that the gun had to constantly be readjusted. Now understand, the gunman is accurate. He hits Kennedy on two of the three shots. Right? Once in the back, that's shot number two, the magic bullet, and once in the head. But understand, the first shot was the easiest shot. This is the shot that missed, right? It's always been a mystery. This is the ricochet shot that hits the concrete in front of James Tagg, causing debris to fly up and cut Tagg. Now let's focus on the first shot because it opens the door. To more than you think. Now the researchers of the History Channel film, and I give it a hearty thumbs up, it's called JFK, The Missing Bullet. Again, that's JFK, The Missing Bullet. Make a compelling case that the first shot would have landed in the presidential limousine, right? It's a short shot. It's much shorter than the other two shots much shorter, and it would have landed in the limousine. It likely would have hit the president if you look at the trajectories. But for the traffic light that's right there close to the intersection of Houston and Elm. In other words, as the presidential motorcade makes the left turn onto Elm, there's a traffic light that lines up perfectly between the window on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository and where the presidential limo was. Right, folks, this is not on the Zapruder film. Understand, there was a woman in one of the lower floors of the Texas School Book Depository who was making a film. I believe her name was Elsie Dornan. And she stops filming as soon as she hears the first shot. We know where her film ends. There are other people filming. We know where the presidential limousine was. Understand it's a clear shot from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository into the presidential limo. You don't have to be a sharpshooter to hit it. It's a little more than a hundred feet. It's very close. But for the traffic light apparatus, that's in the way, right? It's not the tree that deflects the shot, as many historians thought. No, if you look at the films, and if you look at when Dornan's film cuts off, and she cuts it off because she hears a gunshot, you understand that the limo is right by the Texas School Book Depository building when the first shot is fired. Let me point out that a Secret Service film made days after the assassination in 1963 shows a big smudge on the traffic light. I don't think people realized at the time that that smudge might actually have been caused by a deflected bullet. What I want viewers of this video to do is to not take anything I say at face value. I encourage you to look at JFK, The Missing Bullet, on History Channel, right? You can look at that on demand, as well as to do your own independent research. 
But let's ask some troubling questions. Had the first shot hit JFK, everyone would have known that the assassin was in the Texas School Book Depository. Understand, folks, this is far away. This is more than 150 feet away from the grassy knoll. This is right by the building. There would have been no confusion about the grassy knoll, about Umbrella Man, who's further down the route, or Black Dog Man. So that opens up the door to some questions. If the actual shooters, or shooter, we'll call it the deep unknown, if the deep unknown wanted to frame Lee Oswald, how do you do that? When Oswald was free to roam around the Texas School Book Depository building. If the shots came from the sixth floor at a time when Oswald is in the Texas School Book Depository doorway, as he claims he was, as the prayer men, videos might show or if he's on the second floor where he is allegedly seen by his boss Roy Truly and officer Marion Baker about 70 to 90 seconds after the assassination how would conspirators be able to tie him into a shooting on the sixth floor. How do you frame a guy who could be away from the sixth floor with witnesses around him at the time of the shooting? Now understand, this video is alternative history. I'm not pretending to track the official version of events. I question the Warren Commission. So let's get off road here. And let's theorize and speculate. The answer might be that you don't have to frame him for doing the shooting. Rather, you frame him for being involved in the conspiracy to do the shooting. So the rifle used is his rifle. His palm print is on the rifle. His fingerprints are on boxes near the rifle where Oswald worked. Those men, Oswald's co-workers on the fifth floor who heard the shooting on the sixth floor, none of them See Oswald come down from the sixth floor. No one, not them, not any other worker, sees Oswald on the staircase. But they don't have to. We want to know and hold accountable anyone involved in the president's murder. If Oswald a Marine who defected to Russia at one point, supplied the rifle, then we at least have one member of the conspiracy. Folks, that might have been the end game here. Oswald is the perfect guy to frame for the murder, isn't he? A former Marine who became an alleged communist He's married to a Russian woman. But who at his job handling books, school books, would know of Oswald's background? Since Oswald barely worked there for a few weeks, I'm guessing likely no one sophisticated enough to pull off the shooting. So who would know Oswald's background 
and that he worked at the Texas School Book Depository. Two groups come to mind. The first is the Russian emigre community, of which Georges de Morinchut was a member. Right? Understand, this de Morinchut guy is a guy some have theorized had connections to the intelligence community. You're going to have to research him on your own. This is an engineer. This is an older guy hanging around a guy in his mid-twenties in Lee Harvey Oswald. Now Oswald, in this Russian emigre group, would talk about his time in Russia as well as his political views. People in that group might have known about the circumstances under which Lee Harvey Oswald was in Russia. Another group that would know about Lee Harvey Oswald and would further know that he had just gotten a job at the Texas School Book Depository would have been the FBI. Understand, Oswald had an FBI contact with whom he kept in touch. In fact, this FBI agent admitted that Oswald gave him a note that after the assassination, the agent flushed down the toilet. Right? Presumably to save embarrassment. But understand, the FBI was keeping tabs on Lee Harvey Oswald because of Oswald's past, right? Oswald, of course, was let back into the country after defecting to the Soviet Union. So the FBI would have known Oswald's past and Oswald's employment situation. Now let's ask a bigger question, and this is speculation. How do you keep a young 24-year-old Lee Oswald from revealing to the public the other members of the conspiracy? And the answer is you might not have to because Oswald, a leftist, accused of killing a pro-civil rights president might not be part of the conspiracy. He might be a patsy. The real killer or killers may have stolen his rifle from Ruth Payne's garage. Understand, Ruth Payne herself, a pacifist, did not know that tenant Lee Harvey Oswald had a rifle in her garage. She didn't know. Oswald is staying at a boarding house. Right? He's trying to work things out with Marina, with whom he's having marital problems. So he goes over to the pains. Right? Before he goes to work the day of the murder. Right? Understand. This rifle was in the garage under some kind of tarp. The landlord did not know that there was a rifle on the property. Right? So understand, we don't know. We don't know whether Oswald took that rifle to work. We'll discuss the alleged curtain rod story in another video, but let's just say it's questionable. No one sees Oswald take the rifle to work. Understand too, Oswald, who supposedly is carrying curtain rods to work that day, has them tucked under his arm, right? He's 5'9 to 5'10. 
we figured out that the disassembled rifle would not have fit under Oswald's arm. Also, the lunch Oswald claimed to be carrying in the paper bag that he had, that he brought to work that day, was confirmed by his wife. No one on the day of the murder sees Oswald carry anything that matched the length requirements of a disassembled rifle. No one. Right there, further questions about whether the paper bag Oswald had that he claimed was carrying his lunch that day had the kind of stain marks you would expect a paper bag carrying a rifle to have. Right, we now know that the paper that was found near the rifle on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository came from a specific room at the Texas School Book Depository to which Oswald did not have access. So understand, Lee Harvey Oswald, when he's arrested, might not have had information on who had his rifle or the fact that his rifle was even at the Texas School Book Depository. If you're going to frame someone, the best way to do it is to deprive them of the information to ID you. Let me say this, Oswald after the assassination might not have been cagey with investigators. Rather, he might have been slowly figuring it out himself. Let's ask some other big questions. Number one, the accuracy of the shooter with Oswald's misaligned off-center rifle is impressive. Oswald buys the rifle in the United States after his return from the Soviet Union. Now he can't legally drive, so he can't drive himself to a gun range. He's a renter, so he can't go into his backyard and start firing up the place. He lives with people. Right? He has a landlord and a wife and kids. Do we have any reliable evidence, any evidence of Oswald practicing with this rifle? Any evidence? Without significant practice, how could he or anyone else be this accurate. Now understand, when his wife Marina first talks with law enforcement, she flatly says that she never saw Oswald practice with this misaligned rifle. Never. Ruth Payne didn't even know that there was a rifle on her property. Well, later, Oswald's wife changes her testimony a little bit. I encourage everyone here to independently research the change. Ask yourself, why would her testimony change? Shouldn't it be consistent? Then ask yourself whether the extremely limited practice that she claims Oswald had with the rifle would result in Oswald being so accurate that the only thing stopping him from hitting the presidential limousine three times, and the limo is moving, right, the whole time, the only thing is the traffic light that deflects the first shot. Let's move to a second question. No one sees Oswald come down from the sixth floor after the shooting. Right, folks, there are several workers around, Jack Doherty, for example, 
who, when Oswald arrives, doesn't see Oswald with the rifle, who is close to the staircase, doesn't see anyone go down the staircase. People don't hear anyone going down the staircase after the murder. Is it possible that someone could have hidden in a storage room of some sort overnight on the sixth floor with Oswald's rifle? Folks, you're talking about a very high-level assassination, the killing of the President of the United States. Understand how significant the motorcade is. In the motorcade is not just the President of the United States and the Governor of the State of Texas, but in the motorcade, and it's curious, is also the Vice President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson. If someone is going to make an assassination attempt on such a high-powered, distinguished motorcade, they might do things like plan it out, be hidden on the floor from which the shots were going to be fired. Know the timeline. Know that at 1230, workers would be out to lunch wouldn't be on that floor. Realize that the sixth floor is different than the fifth floor, right? The fifth floor has three workers on it. The sixth floor has no one. Given that no one is seen coming down the stairs from the sixth floor or heard coming down the stairs from the sixth floor, is it possible that someone was already there, hiding, and stayed there. Let me also point out, too, that no one at the Texas School Book Depository saw anyone strange on the day of the shooting. Right? No one recalls seeing a stranger in the building before the shooting. Could an outsider have already been there, again, overnight, and then emerged at lunchtime with the rifle that had Oswald's palm prints. Keep in mind, there was no gunpowder residue on Oswald's cheeks after the murder, as you would expect from someone who is firing an old misaligned rifle multiple times, three times, right? I'm guessing Oswald's cheek would have been up on the rifle as he looked through the viewfinder. But yet when they did the paraffin tests, no gunpowder residue on his cheek. Could the outsider after the killing have then blended in with law enforcement perhaps the press, when they arrived at the building. Maybe the outsider was a law enforcement insider or a press insider whose presence at the crime scene after a murder wouldn't startle anyone. Let me close by saying this, after Oswald is arrested, it's fascinating. Somehow, after one of the biggest murders in American history, there's a paucity of police notes. There's some notes, but not as many as you would expect. But Oswald was able to correctly tell investigators of the co-workers, employees of the Texas School Book Depository, who were in the lunchroom when he was in the lunchroom, minutes before he claims he walked outside to stand in the doorway of the Texas School Book Depository while the presidential limousine passed him. Now, how could he have done so? 
right? He names two African-American guys who passed through the lunchroom, right? The schedule is a little bit different because on this workday, the president of the United States has a motorcade that's going to pass right by. So things are a little bit different. Many of the people are outside. They want to see the president. How is Oswald inside, right before he goes outside, able to identify workers in that lunchroom right before the shooting takes place, unless he was in the lunchroom? Understand, the prayer men video that has an unidentified person, roughly Oswald's height, wearing the same colored clothes Oswald wore the day of the murder, standing in the doorway with his hands like this. That Prayerman video, which did not surface for years after the assassination, but we now know it's accurate because it's two different news outlets, right? It's two different videos that show the same person That Prayerman video is striking because while no one in the doorway has a clear memory of Oswald being in the doorway with them, no one in the doorway noticed anyone strange that day. Folks, it can't be both. We know someone is standing there in the doorway with other Texas School Book Depository workers. Either the person is familiar or the person is not. But here's the ultimate coincidence. How could it be that Oswald could tell the police after he's arrested in the brief time that he's still alive? How could he tell the police without knowing of this video that he was there? and then have a person appear on the video who looks like him, who's wearing similar clothes. Understand, so many things could have gone wrong in the video. Someone could have been Oswald's height, Oswald's weight, and could have been wearing a different outfit. And again, we know the clothes Oswald was wearing because he spotted by Officer Marion Baker, according to Baker, about a minute and a half after the assassination. So I believe we need to be skeptical here. When my parents were alive, I talked with my dad extensively about the Kennedy assassination, extensively. Right? And as you could imagine, he had incomplete information because we didn't have great things like the Internet back then. Right? Some of the information came out years later. The American people didn't see the Zapruder film for years. Right? The Prayer Men video. That's within the last 10 years. For years, we thought the cops had practically no notes. Now we're finding out that some notes were written, that Oswald did tell them where he was. Now we're finding out that some Texas School Book Depository people saw Oswald, not on the sixth floor, but on the second floor, shortly before the murders. Right? Again, there are people by the stairs. No one sees Oswald come down from the sixth floor. Certainly no one sees Oswald go up to the sixth floor right before the murder. Let's also talk about the logistics for a moment. If Oswald brings a disassembled rifle to the crime scene, doesn't he need time to assemble the rifle? Folks, no one sees Oswald 
with anything approaching a rifle package, right? And no one sees Oswald assembling the rifle. So in 2021, we know we don't even have to get into the doctors at Parkland Hospital who drew a hole in the back of Kennedy's head. We don't even have to get into that. We don't even have to get into the people on the grassy knoll right after the assassination who, for whatever reason, lied and told people that they were Secret Service members. To figure out here that Lee Harvey Oswald had a defense and given that the people who saw the shooter, think about the amount of evidence that's been discounted historically. The people who saw the shooter saw someone with different hair than Lee Harvey Oswald, right? Bald, Oswald's not bald. Lighter colored hair. Saw someone wearing different clothes than Lee Harvey Oswald, right? Even Marion Baker pointed out that the clothes he saw Oswald wearing were dark. Understand, Oswald gets a lift to work. The two people who see him that morning see Oswald's clothes. They're dark. But yet, five of the six people who see the gunman from the street, they look up, they see the guy with a gun. That's the kind of memory you would remember, right? That's the kind of thing that would stay with you. Five of them have the guy wearing light-colored clothes, which Oswald's not wearing 90 seconds after the assassination. So I hope this generation, as they look at the evidence of the Kennedy assassination from an earlier generation, one before me, continues to look hard so that whatever happened on November the 22nd, 1963, is fully uncovered, right? The Kennedy assassination had a profound impact on American history. There are many who believe we would have been out of Vietnam years earlier, years earlier, right? I believe the key question here, the key question is, is it possible that whoever killed Kennedy understood that they wouldn't have to place Oswald in the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository to frame him for the murder? If the American public learned that Oswald's rifle was used, right? and that Oswald was a former communist who was involved in fair play for Cuba. The American public might be outraged. This might be a situation where the public would think, okay, fine, maybe Oswald was in the doorway of the Texas School Book Depository, or maybe he's in the cafeteria. Maybe he's on the second floor having a Coke. But even though he's not the shooter, this commie was involved in the killing of our president. Think of it from a 63 point of view, right? Maybe that's the game plan and maybe it morphs into Oswald did the shooting. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.